Scammers. You're familiar with call centres ripping off the elderly, but the art of the scam is as old as time. So have you ever wondered what scams looked like in the ancient world? Insurance fraud, identity theft, and a scheme by the richest man in Rome. In this video, I'm going to look at five of my favourite con artists and scammers from the ancient world. First up, some good old fashioned insurance fraud from 300 BCE. A Greek merchant named Hegestratos took out an insurance policy on his ship called Bottomry. The idea of Bottomry was that the ship owner would provide their ship as collateral for a loan, which they could use to fund things like the voyage and repairs to the ship. However, in the event that the ship sunk, the loan would not have to be repaid, and the insurer bore the debt. Hegestratus took out a large sum of insurance and was planning on deliberately sinking the ship halfway through its voyage to keep the money. However, unfortunately for Hegestratus, his crew got wind of the plan and confronted him. Not able to face the consequences, he jumped overboard and drowned. Moving on to Egypt now and a little bit of scamming the consumer, I present to you the case of the dummy mummy. So, there was an ancient Egyptian practice of mummifying animals. Sometimes it was to keep their master's company in the afterlife, but most often they were purchased to be an offering to the gods. Once purchased, they would be placed in temple walls and in clay jars and pots. However, it turns out that some of these mummies sold to customers were not all they appeared. This x-ray picture shows a real mummified bird, skeleton and all, on the left. But on the right, the fake has no skeleton. These fakes could be filled with rags and bits of rubbish smooshed together to look like a bird. Some Egyptologists suggest that these birds were sold to unsuspecting customers when supply could not meet demand. So I guess before there were fake Nikes, there were fake bird mummies. How about a case of ancient identity theft? Forget Frank Abagnale from Catch Me If You Can pretending to be a pilot or a doctor, what about impersonating a king? Now there are different accounts of this story, but in the one that we're going to look at, Bardia was the younger son of the famous Persian ruler Cyrus the Great. On his deathbed, Cyrus made Bardia a governor of some far eastern provinces. But before he left, Bardia's brother, Cambyses II, secretly killed him. Apparently his death was not known to the people, and so a usurper named Guamata claimed to be Bardia and pronounced himself king in 522 BCE. The brother, Cambyses, marched against this rebel, but died of an injury. Before his death, he admitted to killing his brother to try and undo the fraudster, but apparently not many people believed him, and no one was willing to oppose the new imposter king, so he ruled for several more months. Finally, some nobles got wind that their ruler was a fake and made a plan. They surprise attacked him and stabbed him to death. This allowed Darius to seize the throne. However, historians believe Darius may have invented the story to justify his rise to power. Step aside, Anna Sorokin. That is a tale worthy of a Netflix true crime special. Our next tale comes from the folkloric story of Jacob and Laban in the Bible. The book of Genesis records the adventures of Jacob trying to find a wife from the household of Laban. Laban famously makes him work for seven years before he can marry his daughter Rachel. But on the wedding night, Laban pulled a switcheroo and Jacob consummated the marriage with Rachel's sister, Leah. And so he had to work seven more years before he could marry the love of his life, Rachel. So after 14 years, Jacob's ready to get the hell out of there, and they agree on a severance package. Jacob gets to take some of the flock, all the ones that are speckled and spotted. Jacob cunningly devises a plan. He's going to whip up some magic herbal remedy by putting some stripy plant rods by the watering troughs. Apparently that was enough to make the animals produce spotted and speckled offspring. Jacob took things a step further and only let the strong animals drink from the stripy plant water. The weak animals just got regular water. And so Jacob took the best of Laban's flock when he left. The chapter finishes by saying that Jacob grew exceedingly rich from this. 
Now this last one isn't exactly fraud, but it's certainly call centre scammer levels of preying on the vulnerable. Marcus Licinius Crassus was a Roman general, and is often called the richest man in Rome. How did Crassus get rich? Real estate. One of the ways Crassus acquired vast amounts of real estate was through fire sales. Oh my god! We're having a fire sale! No, literally, fire sales. During this period, construction standards weren't great. Homes were packed together, made of wood, and there were a lot of fires. Plutarch tells us that Crassus would go to the houses that were on fire and negotiate with the owners and their neighbours while they were panicking because their houses were burning down in order to buy them for a fraction of the cost. He even had an army of 500 slaves who would rebuild these homes which he would own. Plutarch's wording seems to imply that Crassus was buying the houses while they were still on fire, and by doing so he became one of the largest landholders in Rome. Crassus frequently gets credited for running the first ancient fire brigade, but there's nothing to suggest he ever put out those fires. Nope, just a wealthy businessman taking advantage of people's panic in terrible circumstances. So there you have it, elaborate schemes to lie, steal and rip people off are as old as time. Thanks for watching, if you enjoyed the video consider supporting the channel, my name's Lachlan and you've been watching Bible Unboxed. Commandment number 11, share and comment below.